Okay, so now we are going to talk about uh, a result known as SL equals L, uh, but the full name is like undirected ST connectivity and deterministic clock space. We'll see what I mean by that. But, uh, uh, but let's take a, a let's start by uh, introducing some some uh, you know terminology and in the model of space bounded computation. Time time bounded computation is something we're used to. So when you see it in complexity theory, you, you know the the thing that annoys you is the the formality. But everything is like very intuitive. And here it's not like that. I mean, when you do space bounded computation, there are a couple of things you kind of need to digest. Uh, in order to know how to work with space. Okay. We want to do those. <laughs> I'll kind of, we are going to do something, actually, I, I, I didn't, I wasn't sure what I want to do here, but I eventually I decided to do like a clear cut. So Omer's paper is like breaking all the rules in doing space bounded computation. When you do space bounded computation, you start with the model, and then they tell you, you know, we tell you that, uh, yeah. You know, you can assume that you can do this and that, you pay only log n in overhead, it's, it's okay, it's fine, it's fine. And you have these composition theorems that we don't, and, and everything's okay. And you do some examples, and you see that you have precision issues. Anyhow, uh, Omer actually kind of was, it was like, I'm going to play with the wires of the Turing machine. Like, uh, it doesn't, doesn't have wires technically, but you know, the, the, the head of the Turing machine, I'm going to work very, like very low level space bound in computation. No, not the, not the, you can actually implement that in the state, right, actually, yes, you can do that even, but I'm not going to actually implement it. So what I should have done, and actually started to, and when I removed the slides, and, uh, is to actually give you an example of how like a proper, usual, space-bounded algorithm works, uh, but it takes some time, and we don't have so much time, and then we see how we, we break the rules. Uh, but instead, we're just going to break the rules, uh, and hopefully... Uh, you'll still appreciate it, okay, so, yeah, it's like, okay, okay, so let's see, oh, so, <laughs> good, so I think I'm having the whole slide, these are the slides which I said I, I want to, I won't do, or maybe, no, that's fine, yeah, that's fine, okay, no, no, good, yeah, all right, so that's fine, yeah, it's, uh, no, you know, it's 26, it was more, so, let, but just to, I uh, just left one, one thing, so just to, sim uh, to explain, Exemplify things. So, say you have two n bit numbers. I just want to make sure that you understand that before we move to the definitions. Uh, let's denote it by a0 up to a n minus 1 and b0 up to b n minus 1, and I want to add them up. Intuitively, in your guts, what's the space complexity of that problem? Another answer? Like, <laughs> oh. Oh, good. So you have like constant. No, but you meant two, right? Like because two or three. Right. So all of one, we have a log n. Some, someone should say n. Wait, n plus one. N plus one, good, or something. Even in the naive solution, actually. Right. Even oh, the naive solution. Good. I think it's the whole one. Uh, good and wrong. Uh, good, yeah, exactly. Good, yeah, exactly. So, 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 a couple of things happened here, and all, all of them should have come. Good. So, first of all, uh, you can say it depends on the algorithm, right? So, there are algorithms, the like crazy algorithms. So, there are algorithms which are less naive than what I'm going to present. They still have the same space complexity. You cannot have better space complexity than what I'm going to say. Uh, but there are, uh, what you said is, uh, is is more parallel. Uh, but I'm, uh, let me ignore that, but it's right. You can compute all the carries ahead of time. Uh, and the second thing, and uh, uh, more important, like in the general context, is how do you account for space usage? Like, what's going on? I mean, for example, you're given two n bits. Is this part of the space that you are work that you should be, uh, right? So the answer here is no. Yeah, because, you know, someone gave you an input. It's not your problem that the input is long. Maybe the, maybe the answer is zero or one, yes or no. And uh, you can do it like in constant additional space. You can take a piece of paper and look at the input like that, and tell him the answer. With constant, with just one little piece of paper. So it's not fair and it's not, uh, I mean, fair is like, it's not also smartphone compositions, but it's not fair uh, to, uh, you know, make you pay for the input length. No, that makes sense. Can you override the input? No, 
Good. That's what Omer does. But that's, I'm, I'm starting nicely. Yes. Wow, listen, you're going to the next slide here. So you see, but uh, you asked about this and you asked about that. But so you, you can go both way on the input? Uh, because, you know, someone gives you a question, you can read it like many times, that's fine. You can try there, you can cheat. And if you wider it, I count it as something you wrote, so it's space usage. And, uh, sorry, you. Uh, so that you have like the working uh, thing. Right, no, but I'm trying to, yeah. And then there's also, the question, okay, the input is of length n, uh, I shouldn't be accounted for that, but the output is also of length n, n plus one. Right? So should you account me for that? That's a more subtle question. Yes. There's no point in the space then, right? Right. So the answer is no, you shouldn't account me for that. That I know it sounds funny. You shouldn't account me for that because it's it's part of the problem's like definition that the output length is n one plus one. It's not about the space it requires you to compute out. So it's I mean you can you can define you can define the, 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 the you can account someone for also for the output, but it's not smart composition wise. There are reasons you don't want to do that. You wouldn't want to do that. Uh, maybe I'll say a little bit about that. But also it, it's better to really have a refined analysis of. What's the input space usage? What's the output space? Usage? It has nothing to do with you as a, as a group programmer. There's also what is behind it. The model is thinking about the output is right only. Then you can just. Uh, Very good. Yeah, good. And right only in one direction. Good. So in order not to cheat, I have to make it right only in one direction. Not to cheat. Like, you shouldn't count it if you just think about what the output means as something that you. You fall you to the air. Exactly. Exactly. So if, if you, exactly. So the way you think about the output, I mean, I don't want to uh, account you for the space of using the output, but I don't want you to cheat because then you don't have the right model. So what you, you what you do, you, you, you can have two kind of uh, equivalent formulations. You can say, I'm just outputting a bit per bit. I'm not storing them at all. There, are, there is no tape. Uh, but if you want to work with tapes and you do, then the way to model that, because sometimes this is the input type of something else. That's uh, Right. So you have to do what the girl said, and you know, it's going to be a tape, but not in the traditional way. It's going to be right only and from left to right, like four in the bits. I'm just putting it in there. I, I can't see be, be below what I put. And if someone wants to use it as its input, he can. That's why it, it's nice to have it as a tape. But it's, but having it right only and moving only to the right, uh, make sure you don't misuse, misuse it. Is the input also? No. With the input, you can read as you, as you want. Here, actually, it's a problem that you don't really need so much to... Uh, if you organize it in the right way, like A, right. Zero, yeah. Zero, easy. Right. Here, you don't... Have, even if the, right, the input is read-only, like, essentially. A read-only moving left or, or right, <laughs> depending how you write things. Um, uh, so, okay. So, having said that, there is one more thing. Is... And I don't even talk about anonymous. What's, uh, so n is not going to be the answer because we just decided that the input and output are not going to be accounted for, the space usage. But is it log in or order of one? I mean, it's a subtle difference here that Omer makes use of. I mean, when you say all of one, what you mean is that it's not your responsibility. You don't, you don't, you are not accounted for remembering which bit you're adding because for that you will need log in bits. Right. So, so if you have a so, right, move, just move, right. So, in the output, you just you just you have to go right, always right, or left in this picture. Right. 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 Imagine that they would give you a zero and this zero at the beginning or something. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> yes. Um. Yeah. Actually, you're right. Because here, like the motifs, the like double tick type, the the remainder is gonna be all of one. one right. Right. Good. So in this, so oh, so the so the question is. Do you remember? Do you need to remember where the head is? Or oh, I mean, the head sits somewhere. You can move it left or right. That's how it works in Turing machines. You can remember where the head is if you want to, but that would require space, right? 
Uh, and here it's really a question about how, for example, in this case, how the input is being organized to you. If you are given it, a, you know, A0, B0, A1, B1, A2, B2, that's it, then that will cost you all of one space. If it were given like this and then that, it would require all of log n space. So usually what people say is that, you know, uh, by paying log n, you can just remember where the head is. You can have a log n uh, indexes, n is the input length. And then it's not an issue, just pay a log n, leave me alone, and it, there is not much uh, issues about presentation. And sometimes you can't assume that someone gives you this as, a, as an input. That it's not fair that this is the input. Um, so it depends. So it's order of one if you uh, know the crooks of the thing, how the things works, and it's log n in general in this problem. Okay, so with that, let me just uh, uh, formalize what we said, and we will add randomness afterwards. So we will consider a Turing machine that has four tapes, the randomness we'll talk about in a second. So there is an input tape, output tape, and work tape. The work tape is the only thing that we are uh, accounting for as our space usage. So the input tape is read-only, so that we won't store things in the input and maybe fix them afterwards, or if you don't need them. For every for every such uh, thing, there is a way to gain in space. This is the wrong model. So the input is read-only, but you can move left and right as you wish. Again, you don't remember where the head is. Just move it, and it's there. If you want, you can remember in the work space, in the work tape, where it is. So it's read-only. You can move left and right. The output tape, so as Gar said, it has to be write-only and only moving right. That's like throwing the bits to the to the reader. Uh, but it's nice to have to consider it as a tape so that it could be an input tape of someone else. Uh, you can imagine recursion, compositions. Uh, uh, the work tape is like the most flexible one. You pay a lot for it. It's, there's a premium, right? So it's read and write. Not only it's, you can move left and right. You can do whatever you want. It's your tape. And there's also the randomness tape. That's a bit more subtle. But uh, like the, you know, in the output tape, what we actually tried to... Uh, simulate using tapes is the fact that we're throwing bits away and someone can catch them. So in randomness, it's the other way around. Someone throws bits at us and we can save them if we want, but uh, we do that in the work tape, not here. And we can't write them. We can't tell them, you know, you gave me a one, so we clear the one, put like a zero there. You can't say that to someone that throws bits at you. That's uh, space. So the randomness tape, uh, kind of analog to the output tape, it's read only. You just read a bit and you're moving from uh, left to right in the sense that uh, you're just getting new bits all the time. You can store them, but it works in space. It, it will cost you in space. You'll do it, you do it in the work tape. In the, in the work tape, if I'm using n different cells, but at any time, I'm only using Good. two. Good. That's, that's two. Cool. Right, so I'll, I'll define it in the next slide. It's the, the place you got to last. Right? You can reuse space. No, but so it's not two. Ah, sorry, so. I'm ah, saying, at every single time I have only two that I work with, everything else is empty, but the places. Ah, I see. No, no. So it's the last place you reached. I mean, in general, you always work locally. So. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Oh, no, actually. But actually, it's it may be log n because you can simulate that uh, later. Like no, I'm saying that I, I, I can't see, I can't read. Ah. Location. But yeah. But so, not, but I'm... right. So, but you can go back and forth. You say you, you only walk. You can't. Can't you know where you yeah. No. You no go there until you reach something. Right. So every time. So the, the okay. So we'll talk about it later. But uh, the space complexity is the last cell you reach. Um, okay, so let's have a break, and that's exactly what, what's going to happen here. Good. Good. Okay, so uh, let's continue. So this is the same slide as before, but I just added definitions and remarks. So uh, as you asked, so on input X, the space complexity, S of X, is the number of cells used in the workspace, like in the work tape, but like the last cell used. Um, if you ended up clearing it, it doesn't help you. It's, it's the last step you used is the step uh, the space complexity. And we usually write S of N, not S of X, 
Well, n, you know, s of n is the maximum over all uh, length n strings, like x is the input string. Right, so we don't measure the space in terms of a string, an input string, but in terms of uh, input length. Usually it's, it's kind of, it uh, doesn't really matter much. And the thing that you kind of should believe me is that typically n is much larger than s. Like the space complex, the other one, it's not an interesting. The space complexity is uh, usually like log n, or stuff, log square of n, or stuff like that. Uh, when you do space complexity, because if you, if it's not like that, you don't, you're not really doing space complexity, it's like a trivial thing. So usually in all the situation that we'll have, you should think of S as much smaller than N, like usually even polylog N. Now the randomness complexity, depending how you define it, R of X or R of N, like N is the input length, is, uh, it, you know, it's the number of bits you read from the random, randomness tape. And usually you can think of it as in depending. So it's, it's definitely bounded by the running time, because at every time step you can read one thing. So it's, you know, for, Polynomial type algorithms, it's at most poly n, but usually it's also much smaller than n, also. It doesn't really matter, I'm just saying, you know, you know scale accordingly. This is how things behave. I'm, I'm not going to use that, I'm just giving you the context. And some technicalities that we talked about, every tape has a head, and we don't remember, like, the head location. What, you know, we don't remember the location it, it points to, it's just there. If we want, we can keep track of uh, the location. That's what's written here. Uh, as I said, n is typically the largest parameter. And if you don't care so much about things, that's what you learn in the fourth kind of lecture in space complexity. Uh, assuming the assuming you are locating like log n space for head uh, and other uh, kind of meta computational stuff, then uh, you, you can assume a lot of things. For example, you can assume that you have many additional work tapes and so forth. You can go over, you can manage the pointers, you can imitate many, uh, you know, maybe even log n, but you know, say constant number of work tapes using one work tape and so forth. That's not what we are going to do, okay, today. But that's what you usually do in a normal algorithm. Uh, some more stuff, uh, right, so, one of my, if not the favorite question in complexity is uh, what will we call DPL equals L versus L, depending if you believe it equals L or not. So the question is, can you simulate any space S? And again, here S is like a function of N. Any space S randomized algorithm deterministically, so can you de-randomize it, with only a constant overhead in space? Order of S, 5S. Right. If you can do that, uh, uh, you'll be famous. But if you can do that, you essentially show that randomness doesn't add power to computationally bounded, uh, to uh, space bounded algorithms. And uh, yeah, so currently we don't know of an algorithm that cannot be computed in space bounded uh, computation. So, uh, no, no, but uh, it's just the fact of life currently. Uh, it, it's not believable, true. But uh, but I'm, I'm saying that you know the randomizing space is like uh, you know the, the thing you would really want to do is randomize time. Uh, like say every algorithm can be with some maybe polynomial over it in time you can randomize it. That's uh, provably very difficult. You can prove that it implies circuit low bounds and circuit low bounds uh, are difficult. They're actually equivalent these two problems. Um, it was a big surprise. Usually, in a course in pseudorandomness, you teach that, but uh, you know, I have to, I have to choose. Uh, in space, you know, there is no like inherent barrier for de-randomizing space. It turns out that it's easier, or you know, for us human beings. You know. uh, and okay, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But just keep in mind, you know, avo avoiding all I said before. The regime of interest is when S is at least log n. Right, so we are going to tweak things and so forth, but generally, and the big picture is that, you know, if you're looking at algorithms that have like constant space, these are just automatas, right? You have the automata of the Turing machine and constant space, you can, you can simulate that with more states. So constant space is something that was interesting like 60 years ago. Some people still do it, it's cool, but it's not what uh, we're talking about. Space, it's interesting you can show that if the space is at most log log n, you can't do much. 
if it's more than again, you can do things that you might not have considered possible. But the interesting part, uh, interesting regime is more than again. Like, these are all the algorithms you know. Uh, I mean, I, if you don't have that space, you, don't, you can't remember like where you are in the computation, right? So it's really like input dependent and stuff like that. Uh, it's not what you usually do. Again, today we will do it, but it, uh, but for the purpose of that regime, anyhow. So in general, you should think of space as at least log n, except for today. And today is the only time we talk about space uh, in this context. And the interesting thing is that it's not hard, but it's just kind of a padding argument, is that uh, if you want to de-randomize any algorithm, actually log n is the hardest uh, regime. So assuming S is log n, if you can de-randomize a logarithmic space algorithm, you can de-randomize any algorithm. Okay. It's just a little padding argument that if you know a little bit of complexity, you can do by yourself. So really what I'm saying is that generally you should think of a logarithmic space algorithm when you're doing space-bounded de-randomization. And DPL stands for that. So L is for log space. So L is the class of logarithmic space deterministic algorithms. And BPL is the two-sided error randomized algorithms. Bounded probabilistic logarithmic space. That's the abbreviation. Questions? What is this space simulates? Like what is the right. So for any algorithm, you want to prove the existence or find another algorithm that uh, is deterministic. So simulate is just, it does the, it has the same functionality, but in our case, it doesn't use randomness. Right. And there is a distinction that no one actually cares much about uh, whether you can prove the existence of the algorithm or you can actually have the algorithm. But no one ever, as far as I think, was able to prove the existence of an algorithm without finding it. There, there, is a, there is a limit. Like You can prove the existence of things, like graphs, probabilistic methods, but proving the existence of an algorithm is proving the existence of a Turing machine, like a state, like uh, the states and the delta function. But if you think how they prove that the uh, Turing machine is a different uh, space, mm -hmm. like a uh, total space, right. uh, are significantly strong, like right. the frame to the machine, yes, the, the more space, yes. the other again, yes. But in, in the proof of this uh, theorem, it yeah. shows that it's like, totally higher. <laughs> right, right. What I meant, like, I meant, like, real, you have, you, have an, you have a problem and you want to prove it, it's in some class, prove the existence of an algorithm. Yeah, that's the hierarchy theorems are always like that. But, uh, uh, yeah, that's a good point. But it's not, like, natural problem that you are trying to find. Yeah. Uh, okay, so these are the two things I said. That's why there are 26 lines, because there is a pause. Right? And, uh, and again, L stands for the class of all languages computable in deterministic logarithmic space. Uh, BPL is the class of randomized algorithm using logarithmic space, but two-sided randomized algorithm. So you can err on both ends. You can have false positive and false negatives. And RL captures uh, one of the one-sided error. Uh, there is a core in also. But, so I don't remember which. I think there are no false negatives here. I, I never remember. Yeah. Very interesting, yes, yes. So we don't know anything much about RL that we don't know about BPL already. All right, so our understanding of both is roughly the same. Yes, it's, it's really interesting. So I could have written RL even with the same. You, you'll see me famous. All right. So it is conjecture that BPL equals L. I don't know if you would have believed it at first place, but it is conjecture to be the case. There are reasons to things like that, to things that. If you believe in other conjectures that you probably would believe and it will follow, for example. I'm uh, in the minority in which I'm not completely uh, sure of that uh, because the conjecture that you need to assume are really strong. I would, there are, uh, I don't want to go there, but. Uh, uh. So the reason people believe this conjecture is because in weaker computational models, you can prove these conjectures, but not quite. So you can prove them to the extent that this will follow, actually. So what I believe is that BPL is in L tilde, namely L log L or something. So in up to polylogarithmic, like polylog log in this case, right? Uh, overhead, you can do things. But, you know, I'm, no one takes that too seriously, so not even myself. So uh, and the best known result, and it's from the mid-90s, uh, you know, is BPL sitting in L to the three halves. Three halves mean that you know if this runs in space S, 
I said this could be, you can assume it's log n, but in general, if you have a space S random, randomized algorithm, even two-sided, you can de-randomize it in space S square root of S, like S to the three halves. It's cool. Uh, but it's not one, you want one. Yeah. Okay. So it doesn't mean that um, P space is oh. probably least P space. So I'm doing only, only, ah, P space, space, okay. Uh, yes, right, right. Right, I'll mention that in a second, right. Yeah, right here we are interested in the like we are we are fine grained to the exponent yeah, from from a while ago, and as uh, Gal said, and I'll mention that in a second. Already in the seventies, we knew how to put a two here. Technically for RL, but it's the same algorithm. So doesn't really matter. I keep insulting people. I, I said that Savage proved that and uh, with the two, but and it's the same for RL and PL, but it was a paper by someone. But someone was in the audience when I said that. And he kind of argued, well, it's not the same. I didn't know it was him. So I said, that's the same thing. <laughs> and it is the same. <laughs> well, back then, you know. Okay. I, I would edit that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, no, I think it's like, it's in pension, so I'm fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there, there was one review which was like really uh, with an old context and it was negative for a really strong paper. So maybe, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I didn't remember a quote to me until you just said that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's talk about ST connectivity now. I'm still playing with this NL, BPL, and RL, but I'm just, what I want to say is that all of these, all of these classes, BPL, RL, NL, and SL, whatever that is, can be uh, so they have problems that are complete for these classes, which are related to graphs, in particular uh, graph connectivity problems. And different, it's, it's really cool, different like graph problems, so if the graph is directed or not and so forth, corresponds to different complexity classes. So let me, let me say uh, a couple of words about that. So given, a, as usual, given a graph G on N vertices and two vertices, vertices S and T, for a source or start and target. Uh, we want to decide, so this is a decision problem, whether there is a path from S to T in G. Right, so I'm saying from because this could be directed. Uh, now, here's the thing, and it's easy to prove, uh, but I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to say in a word how you can do it. So if you solve ST connectivity for directed graphs, directed are the hardest, but it's not symmetric. For directed graphs, in space which is logarithmic in the graph size, and by the way, logarithmic, I mean, I don't care if there are, I don't care what exactly is the graph size, like n or n squared, because like if I count edges or not, because when you sit inside the log, the n squared doesn't really matter, right? Uh, so solving ST connectivity for directed graphs in logarithmic space would imply it's equivalent to n L is equal L. That's a complete problem for that, under log space reduction, but uh, I don't want to go into these things. Uh, and the reason really is that uh, you can just consider the graph of, conf of like configurations of the Turing machine. Uh, exactly, right. And so the graph size is polynomial in the input length, almost linear in the input length, because there are the states also in the, in the, work, in the work type, sorry. Because there is, if the work type, uh, ah, it's exponential in the work type, because uh, Whatever the work tape is, you know, you have a state for every content that it may have. You also should account for the state that you are at, but this is constant number of states. This is like the code. Uh, and so the number of possible configurations you can have is exponential in the space, which I can assume is order of log n times some constant. So the graph size is not n the input length, it's like a exponential in space, which is poly n. But that's fine, poly n, the log doesn't matter. For if you have a, a poly and you one yeah. a, a bit. You can use bits, you can you can use bits and you can uh, simulate non bits with bits. But I'm using really bits here. Like uh, uh, what, what do you have in mind? No, ah, okay. Yes. Yeah, so. 
Ah, I see. I don't think so. I think it's, yeah. But, you know, only when you teach these courses, you really got the details. Uh, and because of that relation, uh, Savage's theorem, uh, who solved ST connectivity for directed graphs in log square n space, it has log n recursive levels, and every time you add log n space usage, doesn't really matter. That puts an L in L squared. L squared, I mean, so whatever I have a L in a function of L, it's like, you know, you do the function to the log n, so log n squared. That's like amazing. I mean, I, it's not hard, but it's amazing. I mean, in, we don't have n p's in p squared. Right? It's like, uh, you know, there's a big difference here, and nothing. We don't have anything for like that. That's amazing. That's squared, right? <laughs> but even even like that's why I say well, nothing. We don't. We have no function which is cool that you can put n p in that instead instead exponential in p next time. But that's that's also general. So for n s. Yes, right. Uh, uh, so, so we solved the ST connectivity problem. But NX is in uh, Oh, no, 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 NX is, yeah. Yeah, X is in Yeah, NX you need to one more. Yeah. NP or X. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, because it's the same. I mean, right, I wrote S L, but it's actually yeah. Uh, yeah. Here you don't have the padding. You don't have to use the padding of it. It's really just uh, yeah, order of S squared. Uh, so yeah, so that's cool, and that's the best we know for N L. N L is non-deterministic logarithmic space. I didn't want to mention too much of that. Now, uh, if you deterministically, so what about DPL, right? So if you deterministically approximate, not not it, it's a harder problem. Approximate the probability. I don't know if it. Yeah. Approximate the probability a random walk on a directed graph uh, from a, uh, a rich ST. So not just deciding whether there is a path, but actually approximating the probabilities up to some you know, plus minus one tenth or something. But if you do this deterministically on directed graphs, so that's hard. That's harder than just solving connectivity. Then that's hard. <laughs> Directed versus undirected graphs. Uh, if you do that in logarithmic space, you put BPL in L. So you put BPL is L. So, um, yeah. And that's essentially the reason why you can borrow the ideas from, that's why he was mad at me. You can borrow the ideas from here to put BPL in L squared. It's the same thing, it's directed graphs. You can approximate. Solving, uh, deciding whether there is a path or approximating in that specific algorithm is roughly the same difficulty. What do you mean by approximate the Right, so if the probability of reaching from S to T, good, I should, I should be more careful. So you, you need to uh, tell me the number of steps uh, that you are shooting for, and it should be in some regime. So maybe poly n steps, and is the graph size. Right. Below it's a different problem. Right, that's a good question. I'm kind of hiding things. Uh, like, what is the probability? Of some length, yeah, poly n length. Uh, right, right, but you want like the answer plus minus one tenth. So it doesn't really solve that question because plus minus one tenth might not, it's not refined enough to, maybe there is no path and, uh, and you get one tenth. A lot of information. Right, exactly. Uh, so it's kind of incomparable, but again, the, 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 the proof, you can just easily, uh, it's a homework question, adapted to prove BPL is in L squared. If you saw this proof, you can do that. You won't even notice that you're doing something. It's the same thing. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> it's really the same thing. Uh, okay. And now, ST connectivity, solving ST connectivity, not approximating probabilities, just connectivity, whether or not there is an edge. On undirected graphs, it's easier. Uh, in logarithmic space, using randomness is easy. It's, that's actually a harder homework <laughs> question than proving that given that. Uh, but it's not hard. You can just show that if you take a long enough walk, you're fine. Actually, it will follow for what you will do in the homework. I'll, 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 when you go to Omer's theorem, you'll show that. It's essentially, it follows from the fact that omega 
in a in a graph in an undirected graph which is connected uh, a non bipartite is bounded away from one it cannot be like one minus exponential is small in n it's only one minus polynomial is small in n and that essentially immediately implies that but uh, it's easy to solve that if you have randomness and uh, the undirected graph and you ask whether s and t are connected you just take a random walk uh, if there is a if there is a path you'll get them that's unlike under a directed graph which you know for example this is like the worst directed graph ever i think uh, yeah let that okay that's fine but i meant here uh yeah, so start working from S to T, see what happens. You, you will never get to T, right? Uh, there is a path. Yeah, in exponential time. In, in, uh, right, so that corresponds to kind of the spectral radius being too close to one. But uh, in the undirected graph, this cannot happen, this phenomenon. And therefore, taking a random walk uh, quite quickly in polynomial time, uh, after polynomial element step, will get you to any vertex that you can reach in your connected component. So that's easy. What's not easy is doing this deterministically. So uh, solving undirected connectivity, so connectivity in undirected graphs, uh, deterministically in logarithmic space, that's hard. And that's what we'll do today. Okay, by the way, it's in logarithmic space because you just have to count the number of steps you're, you're doing and where you are in the graph. You need log and you know, steps to uh, specify in which vertex you are and a counter for how many steps you're having. That's why this is easy. If it, I mean, you can implement poly n time steps in logarithmic space because that's all you need to remember where you are and what what's the time when when should you stop. Uh, and that's hard, like de-randomizing. Oh, I don't know, de-randomizing, but essentially de-randomizing this algorithm. Okay. So this is where we are shooting. Uh, SL. It doesn't really matter. I think S stands for symmetric. I never actually checked. Uh, but uh, SL is essentially the class defined in such a way that this problem is complete uh, with respect to log space reductions. Doesn't really matter. That's symmetric. Symmetric, yeah, I imagine. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I don't know. If you want to solve any of these, you def you you should try to solve that first. Yeah. I, I understand why, like, if you are doing this deterministically. The runtime cannot exceed like ah. the power of the log space, but when you have random, you can just like say oh. time or space. No space. Ah, no space is. Uh, can you bypass the, the exponential? No, time? no, no. Uh, time, time, you can do things, but not space. No, like uh, let's say you have. Like log space, can you run like more than two inside the, the space? Ah, I see. No, because the, the randomness, because it, right. So the time is always bounded by two to the space, unless you unless you allow your algorithm not to halt, which actually is interesting, but uh, never mind. Uh, but the randomness step, you, it's not like that because it's, you read only and go like that, so it doesn't help you. It, it doesn't. You can't run time exponential in the randomness because the the. Right. You need to count how many bits you, you, you output, not not right, not how many you can store and when you get cycles. Right. Yes. Uh, you can't underrate the graph in order to relax the right? Yeah, no, no, I wish. Yeah. Because these are really different things. Like direct I mean, I don't like that so I always was confusing in Hebrew because Mukhuman and Lomakhuman and then so uh, I don't like that this is an adjective of that. <laughs> it's it's not to the same thing with an adjective. These are two different things, like directed graphs and other. It's like they shouldn't be called the same. They should have a, a letter in, in common. Uh, but that's how they call them. Yeah. So undirected graphs are good, directed graphs are bad. But, uh, but you need them, right, for, for solving BPL. You know? uh, right. And, and this, by the way, computational wise, it corresponds to kind of reversible computation because. Uh, if you had, if you can move with the delta function from this configuration, you can move back. It's kind of related to quantum related stuff, and I think it was a motivation, but I don't know more more about it. Maybe maybe you can educate me later. But... <laughs> okay. Okay. I hope I can uh, I can answer. Uh, so 
this is where we are at. We want to prove SL equal L, namely, you can forget about all the classes. We just want, you know, given an undirected graph, deterministically figure out, uh, and, and to vertices, deterministically figure out if, whether there is a path between S and T. Right? Not from even, because it's undirected, just between S and T. Uh, 